we're gonna talk about the supply and demand shock. What I was saying is what's uh, what is the most uh, who's the most vulnerable to the COVID pandemic, uh, and you know we've 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 seen in in, in medical studies it tends to be uh, elderly population and people with pre-existing conditions such as asthma or uh, diabetes. And, but then we say we also need to look at the other part of, of, of this pandemic, which is the economic costs. And then we see people suffering because they cannot get income since their work requires uh, being physically present. Um, so what we're going to try and do is an economic diagnostic, identify the vulnerable people and see how we can help them. Um, this is work in progress and um, we're, we're going to be updating our results. Now, uh, how is the economy affected? So I, I was talking about the supply side and the, the demand side, uh, and we're going to be focusing on whether um, industries uh, are essential or not essential, and if they can be done work remotely. And we're also going to focus on the demand side, seeing that there might be um, uh, that there's um, that there's change in the behaviors where people, for example, are not demanding public transport, though it is considered essential and it is still open. So when we focus on the demand side, uh, and this is, I guess, the picture um, that summarizes a lot of our methodology, we focus on industries and occupations, and they are linked uh, according to the employment. And um, we know which industries are essential or are not essential. Uh, several governments have given their list um, specifying which industries can open and which ones cannot. We also have data thrown in about occupations and their work activities. Uh, so we can link between those two. And uh, we develop a remote labor index. We rate work activities as can be done from home or cannot. And then we map this into occupations. And this way we know which occupations can be uh, done at home which ones cannot. And this can also tell us, you know, for example, industries that are non-essential, what part of the labor could still be done remotely. Uh, so if we look at the top uh, 20 occupations with highest remote labor index, we'll find things like uh, credit analysts, uh, math uh, mathematicians, so basically things that can be done remotely. Uh, then we can see the bottom occupations and you'll see things like bus drivers, things that can definitely not be done at home. Uh, and car repairs, things that need uh, specialized equipment or laboratory, for example. Okay, um, we can, just to put this in a big picture, let's just focus at uh, occupations at the broad level. So we'll have uh, education. Education in general can be done remotely, uh, though people still complain a lot about online classes. Uh, computer and mathematics can also be done remotely. Things that cannot be done remotely, we're talking mostly about construction, farming, and production. Uh, so this is the uh, occupation side. Now let's look at the, so this are broad, class, uh, broad classification level of occupations. Uh, we can look at the industry side, and we see things, uh, industries such as finance and information, they tend to be, uh, you can do them remotely and things like uh, agriculture or accommodation and food services, they definitely cannot be done remotely. So this is mostly just sense checking our index. Uh, and as I said, we're gonna couple this together between what work can be done remotely and what jobs are essential. So uh, the essential part we take from industries, the re remoteness part we take for occupations, we see that you know, workers in non-essential occupations are 36%, workers that cannot work remotely are 56%, uh, uh, 55, yeah, sorry, 56%. And we can also estimate that uh, the workers that cannot work are 21%. So this is the supply shock, the supply shock to employment. Uh, and we can study this also from occupations. So here we have the fraction of employment in essential occupations and the remote labor index of occupations. We have the wage and you can see things like, well, respiratory therapists uh, they cannot. They can definitely not do their work uh, remotely, but they have. They are in an essential industry, so there's no shock there. But for example, carpenters, they're not. They're usually not in essential industries, and they cannot work at home. So this is the part. These are the occupations that basically will not be able to work. Okay, so that's the supply side. How do we deal with the demand side? With the demand side, uh, we look at the Congress Budget Office a, a paper. 
uh, and they, they studied the case of an influenza pandemic, what would happen. So we have information about uh, agriculture, so, so sorry, about um, the decrease in demand of uh, several industries. So broadly speaking, most, most industries decrease their, their, their demand by around 10%. But you see uh, some industries suffer more, so you'll see transport decreasing a lot, uh, accommodation and, and recreation decreases a lot as well. And we see an increase for healthcare. So when there's a pandemic, people increase uh, their demand for healthcare, which is um, what, what we would expect. Uh, and then we merge these two together, right? So we're looking at occupations and we see the demand shock and the supply shock. Uh, so, for example, airline pilots, they work in transport, it's considered an essential industry, so they're not shut down, but they have a huge demand shock because no one wants to fly. And actually, if you want to fly, you need a lot of permits to do it. Um, and people, there's also some people that suffer from both. So you'll see waiters, for example, and cooks, they have both a supply shock because they cannot work remotely and they're not an essential industry, but even if they could, there's no demand for that. Uh, so with this, we can uh, estimate um, the overall shock to different occupations. Okay, uh, sorry. So um, now let's focus to industries. So uh, we, we talk about occupations and industries. Before we map from essential industries to occupations, now we're going to map from the remote labor index, the remote labor index uh, through occupations to industries and take into account, into account how essential they are. Um, and so this is how it looks. It's, it's the same diagram, so supply shock and demand shock. Again, you see things like transport, they, they are essential, so they don't have a supply shock, but they have a huge demand shock. Uh, entertainment and restaurants, they get hit by both. Uh, health actually has an increase in demand uh, and has no supply shock because everyone working on the healthcare sector is considered essential. And um, and well, when it comes to uh, food necessities, uh, manufacturing and mining, there's, there's mixed effects depending on the specifics. And I have to say, uh, the reason we're interested in doing this at the disaggregate level is because we want to then study network effects. So when you look at the network structure and how different industries are coupled, so industry needs input from another industry uh, to produce an output, um, it's, it's, it's very important to know exactly where in the networks the shock are, uh, where do you find the shocks. Okay, uh, so that said, uh, let's talk, for example, about the overall economic costs of the pandemic. As, again, this is just, uh, this is just a, a first order shock, but let's, let's try and couple these things together. So we can take, uh, we have the employment, uh, so this is at aggregate levels. So before I show you pictures about occupations, now I'm just gonna couple, you know, you aggregate all occupations by employment and you see how, how much people cannot work. We talked that it was 21% uh, of workers that cannot supply their labor anymore. Similarly, you can get a 13% demand shock. Of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, an, an occupation can be hit both demand and supply in which case they cannot work. So uh, when they add up, it, it's a total of 24% of, of employment. So this means it's 24% uh, of people that cannot work. It doesn't mean they're, they're unemployed because while well, we have contracts and uh, we might even have things like furlough, so it's, it, it doesn't translate directly to, to unemployment, it translates into people that cannot work. Now, the interesting thing is of those 24% uh, of people that cannot work, it only represents 17% of wages. What this means basically is that it is uh, low wage occupations that are being hit by the shock. And we can also see this in value added. So, um, and so these two um, quantities, we get them from the occupation side, but we can also get it from the industry side. So each industry produces uh, value added. Uh, you could also do this for gross output, it's, it's very similar. Uh, and what you see is, um, uh, it accounts for 22% of the value added. So industries are hit. Um, so you check with which industries are hit by which shock and you can aggregate it uh, counting the value added of each industry and that's how you get to 22%. But let's focus a bit more about uh, this employment and wages thing. So we, we divide uh, the population into wage quartiles. So the lowest quartile are those workers that make uh, um, Who's, who's saying, well, whose wage is 
uh, in the bottom 25% of all wages. And when you see that in employment, it's a 42% shock. So it means if you're one of the workers in this lowest quartile, there's a 40% chance, according to, to our predictions, that you won't be able to work. Uh, well, if you're in the top quartile, uh, there's only a 7% chance of that. And then what we do is uh, we also check uh, the total wage that this accounts. So uh, if, if you account for the 17% uh, shock of the wages, that accounts for, for a certain amount and you can split it. And you can even see that even in monetary terms, it is the lowest quartile that is paying for this pandemic. Uh, so of course, at the end, they aggregate to 24 and 17 that I mentioned previously. Uh, but the important thing, the, the takeaway from this graph is that it is, um, it is the, low income way, uh, the low income workers that are bearing these economic costs. And even more, we can look, uh, so we can compute the labor shock by taking both the demand and the supply shock side at the occupation level. So uh, if this is saying, for example, there's an 80% decrease for cooks and restaurants, so that's you know, how, how less they're demanded. And you can see uh, nurses actually, or personal charities, they increase their demand. What you can see is that uh, low uh, income occupations are mostly hit hard. Actually, if you go to high wage occupations, it's really only airline pilots that experience a shock. It's actually astonishing to see that sort of in this region of the graph, there's no one. So basically no high wage worker uh, will receive a hard shock. And we can also see the exposure to infection. This measurement, we can take it by ONET. Um, so ONET rates uh, in, indicates which occupations have a, a high exposure to disease and infection. And we can see that from those occupations that have low wage and have a low shock, they tend to have a high exposure to infection. So we see janitors and cleaners here, we see personal KDs. And what this graph is saying is, it's not only that uh, low wage workers are being hit uh, economically, it also means that if you happen not to be hit economically, you are likely to be exposed to the virus. And we're talking here, for example, as I said, as janitors, or uh, things like um, delivery guys. So it's, it's, it's the people that are actually, you know, right now helping us run the economy. And if, if, you know, if you're a low wage worker, you're either not getting paid or you're being exposed to the virus most likely. Um, so that said, I'll, I'll just make some final remarks. Uh, and the purpose of this is, um, that is, as I said, through this diagnostic, we've, we have to take social distancing measurements to protect uh, the groups at higher health risks. And, but we also need to think about uh, um, um, economic policy that we can protect the groups bearing the highest economic cost of the pandemic. And there has been some proposals such as furlough or unemployment benefits. Uh, as I said, this is work in progress. Uh, we focus on shocks, not on impacts. We're very interested in coupling this uh, with the economy at a broad level. Oh, I have to say, all our results are available online. If you have a model and you want to uh, run shock propagation, uh, everything's there. We have all the code and so we have all the code if you want to reproduce the results and you can also just take our results and input them into your model. Uh, and yeah, we're interested in doing uh, sequitur and effects, production networks, financial system, occupational mobility. So our overall picture would be to do, uh, you know, a couple of things like the labor market, the input output network or, or the production or supply chain, uh, have the financial uh, system, get innovation, uh, this is sort of like the overall picture of what we think a good model of the economy would be. At the moment, we're just coupling the labor market and we're going to try and uh, do shock propagation in the input output the network. Uh, and then, you know, there's of course a question of how are we reopening the, what, uh, of reopening the economy? How do we do it step by step? Um, what industries should we open first? That's another question. Those are uh, things we would like to uh, explore as well. Uh, with that, I'll just say uh, thank you. Uh, every, this is our paper online. It's a preprint, and there you can find the link uh, for all the um, uh, for all the data or code you might uh, want. And we're also very happy if, if you email us and have questions. And with that, I'd just uh, like to uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, and and you know, I, I know this are difficult times, so I very much appreciate uh, you take the time. And well, uh, I'm. It's, it's of course sad that we have to be uh, social distancing, but you know, we, I, I guess uh, we, we, lots of phrase, we stand stronger uh, apart, right? So I just, you know, want to say thank you for that.